Hi, my name is Shira Rubinoff. I'm here with Lena Lau, Principal Incident Response Consultant at SecureWorks. Lena, pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. So Lena, since you began your career, how have threats evolved in the cybersphere? And we've seen them evolve tremendously from just slight reactive ways that companies had to posture themselves to being proactive as well as reactive. Can you tell us from your perspective how you've seen them evolve? I think when you talk about cyber threats, you kind of have to break it into two different spheres, nation state sponsored threat groups versus commodity opportunistic threats. And I think when it comes to nation state threat groups, they've become more stealthier in their approach in how they breach organizations. For example, we've seen the rise of those threats coming in through supply chain and them figuring out novel ways of bypassing two-factor authentication. Uh, I'll give you an example where I worked a series of Chinese nation state sponsored threats where, you know, they were using, they were all targeting third party contractor portals. That in comparison to, you know, opportunistic threats, they tend to more switch up their techniques surrounding how to get a phishing email across more effectively. So instead of just sending a Word document, they might send an ISO file, which then the user mounts and then triggers the payload. Right. And would you say also the attack vectors have become so vast that the opportunities for attacks have become that much greater? Yeah, I think that there's been an increase in creativity that the threat actors have been using lately, especially because they're thinking of newer ways. I mean, just even with spamming push notifications to a user's phone to bypass multi-factor authentication, you would think in your mind that that would not work. But it does when it's 3 a.m. and a user is tired and they just accept it. Well, just dealing with human emotion, I got to deal with it. Let me click on it. It has to yeah. be an emergency if someone's clicking to it. And that's where a lot of these phishing emails or the phishing attacks or the social engineering attacks have happened just bit wet by way of human factor relations. Yeah. So what are some common ways threat actors penetrate an organization's environment besides typical phishing emails? I think we're still seeing a lot of the similar ways where threat actors get in, for example, most companies have some kind of web server or an application running on their external perimeter. We're still seeing exploitation of those web servers and you know external points, and then that allowing the attacker's entry into the environment. You already mentioned phishing, and then I think the third one is still you know supply chain attacks, compromising third-party managed systems or moving from one uh, one third party into the core network or stealing credentials from something and then reusing it back into the organization. Well, what kind of examples or what kind of help or, or some things that you could tell organizations what they can do to help maybe tighten their attack surface in order to mitigate some of these risks? Yeah, I think the key one is having an awareness of all your asset inventory. I think a lot of organizations think that just because they have a vulnerability, you know, a vulnerability scanner or, you know, some kind of vulnerability management program. They know everything that that's going on, but they don't really categorize every other factor. For example, you know, mobile phones that they could be giving out to employees, third party managed systems or web servers that they might contract to a third party. Those aren't really in the core system because in organization minds, those are managed by someone else. So that should be an inventory that's dealt with and patched by a third party. And What's funny is threat actors are aware of this, and that's what I've been seeing, especially in the engagements that I've worked on throughout the last year, that especially Chinese nation state groups are targeting. So I have an interesting question for you. So what does a typical day in the life of an incident response consultant look like? And I'm sure no two days are the same. And it would be great if you can share the most exciting parts as well as some of the not so exciting parts, but the, everything and the types of roles that you would play in each of these types of settings. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think my day is basically structured. I'm either working an active incident and helping respond to some kind of meltdown, or I'm running some kind of tabletop exercise, which are like simulated role plays where we make a scenario that would lead to this organization getting compromised and we verbally work through it with the company. And it's a way of getting them ready if a cyber incident happens. In terms of dealing with incidents, they can vary, you know, anywhere from business email compromise to the classic incident response 
work of ransomware all the way through to nation state sponsored threats. And it's a mix of performing forensic work, but a lot of it is actually talking to the client and feeding them what we found and giving them recommendations. And to be honest with you, I think that the real value of having a really good incident response consultant or a good team is their communication skills and their ability to articulate something technical into something tangible that the client can then take away as an action point to work on. I think that's some very good points that you shared. I also like the idea, well, the fact you talked really about training and dealing with yeah. the organization specifically about attacks that might come their way and how to deal with them in real time. Um, I believe that a lot of training, when companies talk about training itself, if it's designated and specific and, and exactly what the company is actually dealing with at the time and not theoretical, it's much more applicable and then it makes more sense and then they can take that into the real world. So I like that you shared that. So beyond all that, what has been your most interesting engagement? And I'm sure you've had plenty, and I'm sure there's certain things you can't tell us, but if you could kind of leave out some names or leave out details that you can't share, what can you share that has been the most exciting thing that you've done so far? I mean, I think I would break it into two different things. For example, there's what's interesting to me from a psychological standpoint, and then there's what's interesting to me from a technical standpoint. So from a psychological standpoint, I had a case last year where we, we actually just did a tabletop exercise with this client around insider threat. Anyway, what then happened was one of the domain administrators decided to sell their credentials online. And then that led to the organization getting breached because this domain admin proceeded to set up MFA that was, you know, the attacker's details, and that allowed the attackers to then move through the environment, dump credentials and compromise the organization. That happened right after the tabletop exercise. So initially when that threat came in, we didn't know if we were being tested against a red team. <laughs> and then the second one, I would say, especially in the region I live in, which is Australia, and within this APJ South region, we are heavily targeted by Chinese nation state threat groups. And so I find, honestly, I find all of the incidents that I've worked relating multiple different Chinese APT groups extremely interesting because they reuse infrastructure. They use clients as a proxy to target another client. And just the way that they kind of reuse techniques and tactics, I find very fascinating, just more because it fits into the geopolitical landscape of what's going on between Australia and China. That's so interesting. And I like the fact you mentioned insider threat. There's the different types of insider threats that can occur and do occur. It's also the non-informed, like somebody sitting there not realizing that they're sharing the information or the malicious insider threat, which is exactly what you said, somebody taking those credentials and utilizing them to do something nefarious um, against the, an organization. So those are important uh, points as well that organizations need to keep at top of mind. Um, besides everything wonderful you've shared with us today, is there any specific types of areas you'd like to share with our audience? Any pointers, any helpful hints, or anything specific that they can do in order to keep themselves more cyber secure than they are today uh, from their teams, uh, whether yeah. within the organization or beyond? Yeah, I would say a lot of, there's always something sexy, like a new sexy technique that gets released and organizations, it kind of scrambles their focus on their priorities. They immediately jump to, okay, we need to deal with this new trending technique without getting their basics right. So I would focus immediately first on the basics. Do you know all the assets in your environment? Are they all well patched? Do you know, can you detect all the series of, you know, most of the majority of the basic threats that are listed in the MITRE attack framework, can you confidently say that you have some tool or some detection rule that can cover that? And then move into the more sophisticated things. I mean, if an organization has a really good posture and they are confident that they've got all the basics right, then I would focus more on where, where the attack trends are going. And right now we're seeing, you know, Chinese nation state groups, Russian nation state groups focus heavily on attacking the cloud, especially compromising Azure environments, Microsoft 365, and finding more pernicious ways of bypassing 2FA. I would then focus on that, but it's, 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 not, the, it's not the right approach for an organization to focus on the sophisticated threats when, you know, they haven't dealt with a threat from 10 years ago. 
I think those are such important points. And I'd like to add even that the attacking that's happening in the cloud, organizations are storing so much data in the cloud that they're not removing the excess data that doesn't need to be stored there. And a lot of these other attacks are more of a distraction, exactly as you said, yeah. from the basics not being totally locked down. So great important points that you shared with us today. Lena, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> pleasure.